The Time of Mission As we leave the church after Sunday Eucharist, we enter again into time, and time, therefore, is the first, quote, object of our Christian faith and action. For it is indeed the icon of our fundamental reality, of the, opti of the optimism as well as, as well as of the pessimism of our life, of life as life, and of life as death. For it is indeed the icon of our fundamental reality, of the optimism as well as of the pessimism of our life, of life as life, and of life as death. Through time, on the one hand, we experience life as a possibility, growth, fulfillment, as a movement toward a future. Through time, on the other hand, all future is dissolved in death and annihilation. Time is the only reality of life, yet it is a strangely non-existent reality. It constantly dissolves, that is, time constantly dissolves life in a past which no longer is, and in a future which is always, which always leads to death. By itself, time is nothing but a line of, tele, of telegraph. By itself, time is nothing but a line of telegraph poles strung out into the distance, and at some point along the way is our death. All generations, all philosophers, have always been aware of this anxiety of time, of its paradox. All philosophy, all religion, is ultimately an attempt to solve the problem of time. And thousands of books, Christian and non-Christian, have been written about it. It is not our purpose, however, to add another, quote, theology of time to all those that exist already. It is rather to describe very briefly the experience of time which Christians have had from the very beginning and which is still given to them in the church. Here again, what the Church offers is not a, quote, solution of a philosophical problem, but a gift. And it, comes, it, and it becomes a solution only as it is accepted, as freely and joyfully as it is given. Or, or it may be, the joy of that gift makes both the problem and the solution unnecessary and un irrelevant. This makes me reflect on... The experience of time as a kid, just the hours going by without any kind of fixed rhythm, or the fixed rhythms feeling meaningless, um, without purpose. I think this is true, that uh, living life according to the time as spelled out in the church calendar year, uh, and in the rhythms of time from day to day, give life a shape that is consonant with it, with um, the hopes for, for growth and self-expansion that the, the hours ticking by um, is oppressive if not seen within a broader context that makes sense of time not as the solution to a philosophical problem but as a gift as he says to understand the gift we shall once more turn to the liturgy Decipher again its for forgotten language. To understand the gift, we shall once more turn to the liturgy. Decipher again its forgotten language. Today, no one, except the peculiar and esoteric race of men called liturgiologists, is interested in what, it, in what was in the past a major preoccupation for Christians. The feasts and the seasons, the cycles of prayer, a very real concern about kairos, the time of liturgical t celebration. Not only the average layman, even theologian, seems to say. The world of Christian symbolism is no longer our world. All this failed. All this is gone, and we have more serious affairs to attend to. It would be unthinkable, ridiculous, to try to solve any, quote, any real problem of modern life by referring it, say, to Easter or Pentecost, or even to Sunday. Yet, at this point, let us ask a few questions. Are these, quote, symbols merely symbolic? Or is their failure perhaps to be explained precisely by the symbolic value attached to them by the Christians themselves, who cease to understand their true nature? And did they not cease to understand this nature because at one time, it would take too long to elaborate on this here, Christians came to think that, quote, religion has nothing to do with time, is in fact salvation from time. Ooh. 
Before we gain the right to dispose of the old symbols, we must understand that the real tragedy of Christianity is not its, quote, compromise with the world and progressive materialism, but on the contrary, its spiritualization and transformation into, quote, religion. And religion, as we know already, has thus come to mean a world of pure spirituality. Okay, so he's translating religion very particularly here. A world of pure spirituality, a concentration of the attention on matters pertaining to the soul. Um, so by religion he means uh, not even saving knowledge, but, um, but just gnosis, um, escape from the world. Okay. So Christians were tempted to reject time altogether and replace it with mysticism and spiritual pursuits to live as Christians out of time and thereby escape its frustrations. To insist that time has no real meaning from the point of view of the kingdom, which is beyond time. And they finally succeeded. They left time meaningless indeed, although full of Christian symbols. And today they themselves do not know what to do with these symbols. For it is impossible to put, back, put Christ back into Christmas if he has not if he has not redeemed, that is, made meaningful, time itself. We must understand, therefore, that the intensive, almost pathological preoccupation of our modern world with time and its, quote, problem is rooted in this specifically Christian failure. It is because of this, Christians, that the world in which we live has literally no time. Is it not true that the more time-saving devices we invent, the less time we have? The joyless rush is interrupted by relaxation. Sit back and relax. But such is the horror of the strange vacuum covered by this truly demonic word, relaxation, that men must take pills to endure it and buy expensive books about how to kill this no man's land of modern living. There is no time because Christianity on the one hand made it impossible for man to live in the old natural time, broke beyond repair the cycle of the eternal return. Note, many ancient cultures and philosophies posited a cyclical notion of time and the cosmos. This was displaced by a biblical notion of a linear, purposeful history beginning with creation and culminating in the eschaton. In the 19th century, Nietzsche repopularized the notion of eternal return. Um, I would say Christianity's notion of time, especially orthodoxy, is more like this. It's going somewhere, but there's still return, and that's the notion of time. Uh, the cycle of time. Um, it has announced the fullness of time. Revealed time as history and fulfillment has truly poisoned us once and for all with the dream of meaningful time. There is no time, on the other hand, because having announced all this, Christianity abandoned time, invited Christians simply to leave it and think of eternity as of an eternal rest, if not relaxation. To be sure, one can still adorn the meaningless time with beautiful symbols and colorful rites, preferably, quote, ancient, one can, at regular intervals, and by consulting the rubrics, change the colors of liturgical vestments and spice the same eternal sermon with some references to Easter or Christmas or Epiphany. All this, inspiring and unlift, uplifting as it may be, has no meaning for the real time in which the real man must live, or rather, for the absence of time, which makes his life a nightmarish alteration of rush and relaxation. And thus our question is, did Christ, the Son of God, rise from the dead on the first day of the week? Did he send his spirit on the day of Pentecost? Did he, in other words, enter time, not only that we may symbolize it in fine celebrations, which, although connected with the days and the hours, have no power to give time a real meaning, to transform it and redeem it? From the beginning, Christians had their own day. And it is in this peculiar nature that we find the key to the Christian experience of time. To recover it, however, we must go beyond Constantine's legislation, which, by instituting Sunday as the compulsory day of rest, made it the Christian substitute for the Jewish Sabbath. After that, the unique and paradoxical significance of the Lord's Day was little by little forgotten. And yet its significance came precisely from this and yet its significance came precisely from its relation to the Sabbath, that is, to the whole biblical understanding of time. In the Jewish religious experience, Sabbath, the seventh day, 
has a tremendous importance. It is the participation by man in and his affirmation of the goodness of God's creation. Sabbath. And God saw it was good, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. The seventh day is thus the joyful acceptance of the world created by God as good. The rest prescribed on that day, and which was somehow obscured later by petty and legalistic prescriptions and taboos, is not at all our modern relaxation and absence of work. It is the act of participation in the Sabbath delight, in the sacredness and fullness of divine peace as the fruit of all work, as the crowning of all time. It has thus both cosmic and eschatological connotations. And so Sabbath is not the absence of work, but the fullness of work the fruit of work, which is not re relaxation per se, but is the resting in um, the goodness of the order that is around you. You cannot relax in a disordered state. There's no relaxation there. Yet this good world, which the Jew blesses on the seventh day, is at the same time the world of sin and revolt against God. And it is time, and its time is the time of man's exile and alienation from God. And therefore, the seventh day points beyond itself toward a new Lord's Day, the day of salvation and redemption of God's triumph over his enemies. In the late Jewish apocalyptic writings, there emerges the idea of a new day, which is both the eighth, because it is beyond the frustrations and limitations of the seven, the time of this world, and the first, because with it begins the new time, that of the kingdom. It is from this idea that the Christian Sunday grew. Christ rose from the dead on the first day after the Sabbath. The life that shone forth from the grave was beyond the inescapable limitations of seven, of time that leads to death. It was thus the beginning of a new life and a new time. It was truly the eighth and first day, and it became the day of the church. The risen Christ, according to the fourth gospel, appeared to his disciples on the first day, and then after eight days. This is the day on which the church celebrates the Eucharist, the sacrament of its ascension to the kingdom and of its participation at the Messianic banquet in the age to come. The day on which the church fulfills itself as new life. The earliest documents mention that Christians met statu die, uh, from Pliny's letter to Trajan. Note, uh, one of the earliest extra-biblical mentions of Christ in Christianity, AD 112 on a fixed day, and nothing in the long history of Christianity could, al could alter the importance of this fixed day. A, quote, fixed day, if Christianity were purely spiritual and eschatological faith, there, um, and eschatological faith, there would have been no need for a fixed day, because mysticism has no interest in time. To save one's soul, one needs, indeed, no calendar. And if Christianity were but a new, quote, religion, it would, have been a, it would have established its calendar with the usual opposition between holy days and profane days, those to be kept and observed and those religiously insignificant. Both understandings did, in fact, appear later. But this was not at the, all the original meaning of the fixed day. It was not meant to be a holy day, opposed to profane ones, a commemoration in time of a past event. Its true meaning was in the transformation of time, not of, the, not of calendar. For on the one hand, Sunday remained one of those one of the days. For more than three centuries, it was not even a day of rest. The first day, the first of the week, fully belonging to this world. Yet on the other hand, on that day, through the Eucharistic ascension, the day of the Lord was revealed and manifested in us all in all its glory and transforming power as the end of this world. So it's beginning and the end, uh, often the Mago day, as the beginning of the world to come. And thus, through that one day, all days, all time were transformed into times of remembrance and expectation. Remembrance and ex anticipation. Remembrance of this ascension, we have seen the true light, and expectation of its coming. All days, all hours, were now referred to this end of all natural life, to the beginning of the new life. The week has no longer a sequence of profane days, with the rest is on the sacred day at their end. It was now a movement from, the Mount, from Mount Tabor into the world, from the world into the never-ending day of the world to come. 
Every day, every hour, acquired now an importance, a gravity it could not have had before. Each day was now to be a step in this movement, a, mo a moment of decision and witness, a time of ultimate meaning. Sunday, therefore, was not a sacred day to be observed apart from all other days and opposed to them. It did not interrupt time with a timeless mystical ecstasy. It was not a break in an otherwise meaningless sequence of days and nights. By remaining one of the ordinary days, and yet by revealing itself through the Eucharist as the eighth and first day, it gave all days their true meaning. It made the time of this world a time of the end, and made it also a time of the beginning. I think this is really good. It um, it connects the idea of time and the transformation of time to the the incarnation. That what Christ does is he unites heaven and earth, and thus, like the uh, time, both becomes eschatological, the end, as well as uh, transformational of this world, the beginning. And so it brings together the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, into a single moment, which. Um, if you are encountering the eternal, it is something that both breaks into the present and uh, transforms the present into what it will be in the future. And so it's the it's the living sustenance that both uh, um, undergirds our life now and uh, transforms us into what we will be in the age to come. And so um, the cycles of time, like all time is meaningful rather than um, just a, a cyclical eternal return um, or a kind of just a, a form of religion um, he talks about Christianity not being religion but in, in his terminology religion is something that discounts the value of the present life rather than the present life being infused with value from the eternal um, I, I don't know if I agree with him on the definition of religion but I find it um, clarifying and helpful uh, that he has um, given us his definition of religion um, which is basically a kind of form of um, eschatological nihilism um, about uh, the meaninglessness of our current life experiences the sanctification of time is thus uh, the way in which God has infused time with his presence through Christ 